So, Ivan, in your capacity here at the National Robotarium, you are trying to take theory into practice with industry. Mm -hmm. So when in this industry come in and talk to you in that first instance, do they understand the depth or the detail of knowledge that they're going to have to implement? No, in general, they don't. Very few companies uh, have the expertise uh, in robotics to implement or understand the solutions that we want to implement. So there's a lot of work to do to get them to understand what's possible, what's not possible, the time scales that uh, will be needed to implement the solutions. And more importantly, I think, uh, gives them a, a dose of reality check on what robotics is capable of. Because there is a lot of misconception through recent movies and recent press that robotics can do anything and everything. So they think it can do more than it necessarily can? In general, they do. And uh, so they expect you to be able to uh, work in any environment, any time of the day. Uh, I'll take an example, in subsea, uh, we've been working on developing solutions to do manipulation and inspection of platforms. If you go to the North Sea, the visibility is about that big on a, <laughs> on a bad day. And that means a lot of the classical sensor you use are not available. So you need to reinvent a solution using, say, acoustic instead of visual. And that comes lots of, with lots of problems and lots of difficult research questions. So I think we're trying to find a balance between what, what they think they need, <coughs> what we can offer, and whether what we can offer has value for them. Because companies are not like governments. They don't want us to publish papers and do novel research. They want to provide value to their business. Mm. And that's a very different frame of mind, I think. So you need to understand that as an academic, that it's not just about the research, it's about the value provided to a customer for the company. So when you've overcome that initial hurdle of misconception, mm. what tend to be the, the number one or two barriers that you see most commonly uh, stopping an organization implementing autonomous machines? So I think you need to establish trust because what you're going to have to have is a team of researchers here and a team of engineers in the company working together. And to establish that trust takes a bit of time. Mm. So we tend to go for small projects which demonstrate the value to the company. That enables the company to then go to the management and unlock larger budgets. And then it's a matter of uh, doing three things, really. One is uh, working collaboratively, making sure it's not, you don't do the research in isolation and every year you come to them and say, have I done the right thing? Mm. And they go, actually, you haven't. We can never use this on a real system. So try again. So you really need to have this collaborative approach. The second thing, you need to have clear demonstration and milestone so that the company is keeping engaged and can see what can be sometimes quite a long-term program but they can see you're progressing on it and they can see the value. So it's ideal if you can say, okay, we're going to have a five-year program, but year one, we're going to give you this bit of that you need now. You can exploit it readily. And as we go along, we'll build all the pieces of the puzzle. And at the end, you'll have the, the big thing. It's really difficult to get the company to invest for five years saying, trust us in five years time, we'll give you the whole thing. The third thing, I guess, is education of the, the, the workforce in the companies. Because if you develop an extremely complex algorithm uh, in the research world and you give it to them as a, a piece of software, if they don't understand the algorithm, when they're going to have to change it, they can't do that. Mm. So if it doesn't do exactly what they want, they will probably abandon it. Or come back to you, but ideally you want to have this technology transfer at the end. And to me, the best way to do technology transfer is to transfer the algorithm, the ideas, but also the people. So if you have a PhD student, for instance, who's work on a project, if they go and then join the company, they come, they come not just with algorithms, they come with their ideas, who they are, with their understanding of the problem, and they can train and drive the idea inside the company. And I've seen that very effectively done in a number of cases. 
you talked about um, small scale projects yeah. necessarily at the moment. Um, regulation from the EU would appear to be stopping some organizations, certainly within the corporate sector, enterprise sector, from pushing ahead with large scale implementations. They're, mm. they're worried that if they go ahead with an implementation and then the regulation is such that it, it determines that they should have done it in a slightly different way, that that's going to cost their business. And therefore, they're not pushing ahead with, with bigger mm. implementations of that technology. Oh, that's clearly happening. So, yeah. so that's a clear issue uh, because the technology is moving so fast at the moment that the, the regulators and the, the government struggle to really understand what the regulation should be. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we're working on a project to monitor fish in the sea around wind farms. Mm -hmm. And we have a, an autonomous platform that was developed by a company probably seven years ago. We are refurbishing it and changing it. And we can't use it at the moment because it doesn't meet the maritime certification authorities. But it's been built seven years ago by a company who, <coughs> and so, so the regulation have just come out now to integrate the notion of autonomous systems up to last June, I think. We were still tied up on regulation of small workboats, which means they're manned systems. So on, on your autonomous system, you have to have a life raft, even if you don't have anybody on, on the system. You have to have a VHF, even if there's nobody to, to respond to the VHF. So, so you see how the, the regulation is catching up. And so if, you, if you're looking at a company who's going to say, I'm going to change all of my fleet of manned vessels, foreign manned vessels, if the regulation is not there, you're talking of multi-billion billion investments, you're probably going to think twice. Okay. So, so it's happening. And when, when you add the ethical aspects of it with the emergence of AI and underground models, then it becomes even more complex, I think. And what impact do you think that's having on education and uh, I suppose the, pro the proliferation of the skills that workers might need to be able to um, utilize autonomous machines more widely and, and prepare themselves for, for whatever emerging economy uh, evolves out of these technologies? I, I'm not sure it has a big impact on the education at university level mm -hmm. because the, the young people and the students are interested naturally in these new things like yep. AI, like robotics. And so it's not a hard sell for us to recruit students. I think when you move to industry, it's a much different picture because there is uh, um, a tendency to be very conservative for legal reason and risk management reason. And so sometimes there's a disconnect between the expectation of the people you've trained and the reality of the work in the workplace. And there's very few companies, certainly in the UK, uh, where you can find the type of jobs that are as stimulating as they expected, I think. Yeah. There's lots of startups, and that's great, but the big companies are mostly in the US at the moment. Uh, do, you think, do you think it has the potential to, to widen a skills gap between, sure, it's great, the, the universities the students who are coming through now, as you say, they are interested, they are exciting. Those who have those opportunities, yes. But perhaps there's an even bigger divide than the current digital skills gap that we see. I think there is a digital skill gap in the existing workforce. Yeah. That's an... an that, well documented. Yeah, well documented. There's no problem. Uh, there are ways you can train that workforce and bring them up to speed with the... using the technology. Mm. When it comes to developing the technology, I think it's more difficult. And that's where the novel, new generation coming from the university is probably more beneficial. Yeah. And you can bridge that gap that way, having the two approaches. The existing workforce can understand, use it, and start maintaining it. And the new workforce can maybe develop the more, more cutting edge aspects of it. I think a place like NR is a good place, because that way you can put in contact those two those two generations yeah. and those two types of workers. You have people will come with industry with a lot of experience on practical operation and what's possible, what's not possible, what's legal, what's dangerous, what's not dangerous, and give that awareness to the people developing the, the next generation technology 
And at the same time, they'll be exposed to the next generation and they'll go, ooh, that's something we could use in our current practice that would save time, make it safer, make it more efficient. Uh, let's, let's embrace it right now. And that gives them the incentive maybe to dig into the, the technology and understand more the, the core principle of the technology. Let's talking about the role NR plays, and you talked a little bit about mm. education. What do you think industry could do to try and help educate the workforce and prepare them for, for whatever changes we might be seeing? So I think industry at top level needs to understand a bit more the technology. So there's an awareness at CEO level. What is AI? What is robotics? What, what are the main trends? What is it capable of now, in five years, in 10 years? So they can map that in their mind and what that will do for their company. And we find NR is doing a lot more of that recently than it was before, which is this education piece and this advice piece to high levels of the company. And then you need an operational plan, I think, to, to do the training. And so we have an ambition in NR to do, I mean, uh, continuous uh, personal development. And we're trying to find ways to, to train the actual engineers and uh, the workforce in the companies once they've agreed on the project plan and how they're going to integ integ inter uh, integrate this technology into their, their processes and into their, their long-term view. But I think it comes from the top. CEO needs to understand what it can be, can be done. They mm. need to have a plan and then bottom-up you can then feed in the right technologies and the right understanding at the, at the workforce level. There's often a lot of sensationalized chatter around this mm -hmm. topic uh, and some people worry that uh, robots and AI will mean that there's no jobs for them left afterwards. Do you think that's a legitimate concern or is, is there a, a third way where people need to understand about augmentation between autonomous machines and humans? I think it's a real concern for AI. I don't think it's such a concern for robotics and AI. So let me explain that. AI can be used for lots of different things. When it comes to robotics, it's used to move robots about. Mm -hmm. And robots are, I think, still quite far away from being capable of doing what humans do in terms of touch, in terms of manipulation, in terms of understanding of the world. And so I think they'll be used initially in areas where and they are used at the moment in areas where humans either can't go, so deep subsea, in space, on Mars, or in area where it's very dangerous to go. So at the moment, there are a lot of dangerous jobs still done by humans. And I think that's the places where the robots will go first, because they might not quite match what the humans can do, but they'll be, it'd be so much safer. And then there's the, the long, much more longer term, where they, ask, they, they start to get as capable as humans in terms of, of the, the, the interaction with the world. And I think at that point, I don't see that happening in the next five to 10 years. Uh, and I think at that point, the society would have evolved or need, need to evolve to, to take that into account. So at the moment, if you have a care worker in a care home, they go to work, they pay taxes, uh, so some, some of the, the activities they do is going back to society. If you replace that by an army of robots, um, who's going to pay the taxes? Yeah? So you need to change fundamentally, I think, a little bit the way we work the economy if you replace worker by robots. And the workers will then do other things. So they have more time to do maybe more creative things, more artistic things, but they might be less productive. The productivity will increase for society, mm -hmm. but individual productivity as an individual might decrease. And you need to have a model that, that solves that. So I don't know if I've answered the question really well, <laughs> but uh, it's a complex problem. Yeah. I think in the short term, it's not, it's not a risk because we're going to create a new, a new industry. So if you look at when people used to manufacture textile, and it was all handmade. And then you bring the machines, and all these people lost their job from in 10 years. But they, they, they reinvented themselves. 
and they found new jobs and you had people you had created a new industry where you need to build a machine, you need to maintain them, you need to to so all of that comes with it. And it's gonna be the same with robotics. So if you have robots, who's gonna maintain them, who's gonna program them, who's gonna look after them? Mm -hmm. uh, you could argue other robots. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I think we, we will see a, a change and we need to manage that change. And what I'm worried about is that governments haven't really even started to think about it. So I think government to start thinking now about what if AI and robotics, and especially AI, changes uh, the basis of the workplace. So there's a lot of um, support job, administrative job, will, that will disappear with AI, I think. Yes, because you did say robotics and AI, not so legitimate, but AI, yes. Yes. I think AI, because AI, I mean, in digital society, we all work in front of a computer, the data comes to us. Mm. So it, it's, I think, a lot simpler now in the digital world to replace a human for some tasks by an automated system. So if you want to book a holiday, 30 years ago, you would have to go to a travel agent. They would do stuff on paper and send you back a piece of paper with your ticket. Nowadays, it's all online. So you could, you could potentially replace, uh, have an automated travel agent. So, and that, that doesn't require, require any interaction with the world, complicated like a carer. We need to go and lift people, care for them, clean them. That's very complicated. But just taking digital trends and sorting out travel, that, that can be automated. Yeah. And that's why AI, I think, will have an impact on the service sector before it has an impact on the construction sector, say. Um, and that's where I think the, the real risk is. Yeah. So it's less, perhaps, those user cases where you, know, you, hear, you hear stories of, of factory workers fearing for their jobs and mental health crises, perhaps, in, in some of those more manual sectors and perhaps more the services sector that we're less focused on at the moment. But you also have to look at it at another angle. Uh, we are struggling to find anybody to work in agriculture to pick up fruits and vegetables and we're struggling to get anybody to go offshore to do this work because it's hard environment. We're struggling to find people to, to go do construction work. So all those areas where you already have a shortage of staff, I can see robotics making inroads there first because the industry will so we need a solution it's not that we we replace human by robots is we don't have the humans can you build the robots mm. and then the robots might not be as efficient as the human to start with but at least they'll provide some solution and gradually they will get better so i think there's areas where we all have already have a shortage of of of, uh, of workforce and where robots will play a role first but i think ai will play a role in the service sector before that as an academic, as someone who does interface with industry, what would you say you would hope to see to make sure that industry and the workforce do harness the opportunities presented by robotics and AI rather than necessarily be concerned about whatever developments there are and, and, and be too conservative? I think we need to educate people now about and I'm not talking just the engineers and the academics and the people who are developing the technology. I'm talking the people who are going to use the technology. We need to start explaining to them what the technology is, how it works, what the limitations of the technologies are, so that the society as a whole understands what, what we're talking about. There's a great risk, I think, that as these technologies are introduced and developed, there's a... a First, some people are left out because they, they don't understand it and they can't engage with it and they might reject it. Uh, and, but also that some people um, don't, really, don't really embrace the technology the way they could because they're, they're not aware of what the technology can do for them. I think education at an early stage now is needed because those technologies are coming. You, you can't really go back in time. Uh, and I think on the, on the, so it's a societal thing that we need to do. And that's why in an hour we're engaging with schools a lot, 
We had thousands of people coming and we visited lots of schools to try to explain what's, what's, what's going to happen. Uh, I think government needs to also think about this and, and start looking at regulations and but also what, are, what is going to be the economic model in, in that if that revolution happens and uh, and I guess our job is to yeah to educate people and but also in industry and educa educate them on on the the possible impact of the development of the technology so what we call responsible research and innovation so it's quite important for us academics but also for the industry to go okay if we develop that technology what's the potential impact on the planet mm. and we've seen with climate change that's not always been the case <laughs> we have a chance to do it right for robotics and ai i think thank you